Good evening. Amaro Butch Graves, Jr., CEO of Black Enterprise, and welcome to the second installment of the Black Enterprise Economic Equity and Racial Justice Town Hall Series, Voter Suppression, How Black Business Leaders Will Protect and Preserve Our Franchise. We cannot afford to remain silent when it comes to any action that seeks to deny us our fundamental rights, diminish our dignity, or hinder our economic progress. There is perhaps no fundamental right more critical to black people's fight for opportunity, equality, and equity in America than the right to vote. Since the 2020 presidential election, more than 43 state legislators have proposed or passed laws to restrict voting rights. Make no mistake, this is a direct backlash against the critical role black voters played in the outcome of the election, including in states like Arizona, Michigan, and Georgia, thereby shifting the balance of power in Congress as well as the occupant of the White House. Perhaps worse, major corporations, many of which have spent the past year pledging their unwavering commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion for black people, were missing in action, or worse, financially supporting those working to limit our access to the vote. To be blunt, this is unacceptable. That's why I joined former American Express Chairman Ken Chenault, Merck Executive Chairman Ken Frazier, and more than 70 other business leaders who were the original signatories on a memo to corporate America quickly followed by a group of more than 700 corporations and executives who signed a similar pledge, challenging corporate America to take a stand against intentionally discriminatory voting legislation. We are engaged in a battle to combat Jim Crow 2.0 that continues to divide our nation. We have witnessed a recent U.S. Supreme Court ruling that has effectively diminished equal access to minority voters and gutted the remaining protective provisions of the Voting Rights Act. Civil rights organizations have been forced to respond to anti-democratic voting bills in Georgia and Florida by filing federal lawsuits to challenge the constitutionality of those laws. And Texas Democrats recently decided to come to Washington for a federal remedy after feeling powerless to stop the Republican-led state legislature from passing laws that would disenfranchise millions of black voters. Such events have brought clarity and urgency to the need for continued vigilance in protecting our franchise. We at Black Enterprise believe the right to vote is directly tied to our 50-year mission to promote economic equity and multi-generational wealth. As the number one black digital media brand, reaching more than 8 million monthly unique visitors, we have utilized our town hall series to place such issues on the front burner, applying a business lens to develop solutions that drive lasting economic and financial empowerment. This evening's discussion We'll explore why we must hold major corporations accountable for failing to take a definitive and public stand for voting rights. We will also discuss how business leaders like you can help preserve and protect the black vote. We are extremely excited to have a five-star panel to engage in this vital conversation. Our town hall speakers include Color of Change CEO Rashad Robinson, National Coalition on Black Civic Participation CEO Melanie Campbell, Black Economic Alliance Executive Director David Clooney, and is led by our dynamic moderator, CNN commentator, attorney, and activist Bakari Sellers. We also invite you to join this important conversation by sharing your questions and comments via the chat feature. We are proud to partner with the Executive Leadership Council, 
the preeminent global organization focused on developing black corporate board and C-suite leaders and our town hall series sponsor. This unique partnership serves as a testament to the power that can be realized when two leading black institutions join forces. Now, before we begin our conversation, we will hear from my good friend, Michael Heider, President and CEO of the Executive Leadership Council. Michael? Good evening. I'm Mike Heider, President and CEO of the Executive Leadership Council. The Executive Leadership Council is proud to be the sole series sponsor of the Black Enterprise Economic Equity and Racial Justice Town Hall Series. Tonight's event on voter suppression shines an urgent spotlight on a topic that we at the ELC believe is critical to the vitality of Black success in corporate America and to our Black community as a whole. The ELC believes the right to vote is a fundamental tenet of our democracy. We denounce any form of voter suppression and will stand against any attempt to limit the right of voters to cast their ballots or participate in the voting process. As Black executives, we know all too well the tremendous sacrifices that have been made to ensure all Americans have the right to vote. And regardless of one's political affiliation, the right to vote must be protected. The ELC will utilize the collective power, agency, and influence of our membership to protect the right to vote for all Americans. Tonight's town hall asks the question, does corporate America have a responsibility to help protect voting rights for Black Americans? We will explore what needs to happen to pass federal legislation in response to continued state legislative efforts to restrict the access to vote. We will also delve into opportunities for us as business leaders, executives, entrepreneurs, and members of the Black community to advance the Black voting rights issue within our spheres of influence. We have a stellar lineup this evening with subject matter experts who are on the cutting edge of this topic. We hope that you find the conversation engaging, informative, and a call to action for how we can and will make a difference on what very well may be one of the most impactful issues of our lifetime. Enjoy the discussion. And welcome to another town hall with Black Enterprise. This is Bukari Sellers. I'm a former member of the South Carolina State House of Representatives. I am the best type of legislator, which is I'm retired uh, from the South Carolina State Legislator, but my uh, two most amazing uh, titles are that of being a uh, husband and a father. Um, today joining me is just an awesome, awesome panel in the truest sense of the word, because we're tackling what I believe to be the civil rights issue of our time. And we'll let you dig in and decide if that holds true. Um, but I, I think I want to introduce this August panel that we have today because we truly want to dig into this issue. I first want to start with um, one of my heroes who uh, puts me in the same mind frame of Fannie Lou Hamer, um, who reminds me so much of those heroines um, and heroes of the civil rights movement. Thinking of Bob Moses today, this town hall, I will I will do this on my own uh, personal volition is in honor of Bob Moses and his um, activism and organizing. But I have to start with Ms. Melanie Campbell. Um, she is the president and CEO of the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation. Um, Melanie recently added to her uh, a resume of being someone who was arrested uh, fighting for justice. Um, and it's a shame that even in 2021, when we're talking about voting rights, Many of our heroes like Melanie are still being arrested today. So thank you so much, Melanie, for all of your hard work, everything that you have done, everything that you are doing and everything that you will do. Next up is Rashad Robinson, who was probably the best dress mugshot, I think, that we had. Uh, he also uh, found himself on the front lines uh, with so many others um, just fighting for what's right, not only 
does he fight with color of change in the boardrooms, changing policies, rules, and regulations of large corporations that directly impact our lives. But as we see, uh, he was on the street with his hat on, getting arrested. So uh, thank you, Rashad, for everything. David Clooney, one of my good friends. I'm so happy that, that David is a part of my world. Uh, not only is he my nexus uh, with Black wealth, like many of us, uh, but he's the executive director of the Black Economic Alliance. And I, I said something when David called me the other day, and I think it stands true, uh, that the, the BEA is one of the first organizations we've had who's purely dedicated uh, to connecting those who ascertain some semblance of Black wealth in this country uh, and connecting them with the grass tops and grassroots in our communities. And I think that that is something we've been missing, and I'm glad BEA is standing in the gap. And so we have a collection of individuals today, and I want to start um, channeling my inner Don Lemon, which means I'm going to throw out a big question, a big, bold question. But in my introduction, I said that uh, voting rights is a civil rights issue of our time. Melanie, I want to start with you. Why are we still here? And talk mm -hmm. about the gravity of why this is important. And it's not necessarily an issue of, poli of partisan politics, or it shouldn't. It's just an issue of whether or not we have a healthy democracy or not. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It is such an honor to be here with all of my heroes and sheroes uh, here. And so, Bakari, thank you so much for that, for all you do uh, and continue to do to fight for justice in so many various ways. And then speak and always speak in truth to power. And, and you do it with style and grace. Uh, maybe not a shop, but Rashad, Rashad with his brims on. I was watching him uh, get, um in that protest with our brothers standing up for voting rights last week. It was really powerful uh, to see that. Um, so at the end of the day, why are we here? That is a, that is a doggone good question, right? Uh, because so many folks that are part of uh, what we're all fighting for uh, keep asking us, how did we get here? Why are we here? Well, it's really about power um, is why we're here. And the role that um, uh, the power of the vote, the power of, of being able to exercise that and leverage that vote um, and the issues around issues of uh, unfinished business of race in this country. There's a lot of nuances to it, but at the end of the day, it really goes down to power and that this nation, the United States of America, which is browning every day uh, uh, because of the diversity, you, you have some folks here who really want to, I believe, uh, in, in the modern day times, change what this, this um, Flawed democracy, as it may be, this democracy is just something that has a minority rule flavor to it, or has an apartheid flavor to it, to control power. And so what we are up against didn't just start with Donald Trump, uh, former president, being elected uh, off of lies and racism and everything else. But it started to me uh, in modern times when President Obama, former President Obama was elected in 2008, and we saw voter suppression laws being put on the books after the 2010 election. And we fought, you know, we fought that and then we lost so much power through the Supreme Court um, in 2013 with a Supreme Court case with uh, Shelby versus Holder, uh, which is Alabama case. And then we fast forward to 2020 and you had uh, the first black woman uh, and South Asian woman become vice president. I think it's more about that than the fact that you have uh, uh, president Biden being the president that it is that you have a woman of color who is now vice president one step away, one sneeze away from being president of the United States. I think part of that core at the core has to do with power and racism and who controls. And so you have people who are willing to change what this democracy is into an autocracy so that, that, that white men can stay in power and stay in control. It's not going to happen, but we have to fight. We're fighting a as far as this is my opinion, uh, based on my being involved in this so, for so long, that's what I see um, as part of how we got here. Rashad, uh, Melanie was able to draw that nexus from uh, Shelby um, through uh, some of the recent court cases we've seen. The Voting Rights Act is practically on a, on a nub all the way to many of the regressive uh, state uh, past laws that we've seen in states like Georgia, Texas, et cetera. So talk to us briefly, just give us a 50,000 foot view of where we are and what compelled you, what sense of urgency compelled you to take to the streets? 
Thank you, Bakar. Thanks for having me. Thanks to the um, you know, Black Enterprise. Uh, always a pleasure to follow my uh, dear sister and hero, Melanie Campbell. I've known her since <laughs> over 20 something years uh back black black youth vote days um so we won't we won't really tell all those years ago but um but so much love and appreciation and and to be clear the brothers who were showing up were following our sisters who the week before put themselves on the line um showed us um as black women consistently do what it means to actually not just speak truth to power but to drive a strategy that, um, um, that so many of us can follow. And so I think it's just incredibly important as, as images of our arrests, as images of our protest um, are, are visible, that it was um, inspired by the sisters. And so, you know, picking up off of what Melanie said, you know, this is part of a multi-part strategy. And this is why I think it's really important uh, for how we think about sort of what do we do to attack it. Melanie's absolutely right in terms of sort of, this is about uh, uh, setting a set of rules to create a minority rule and right. And so you've got the courts, right? And it's an overtaking of the courts so that you get uh, results and policies that are not reflective of the laws, but are reflective of, of sort of a, a certain type of uh, protection of political power. You have uh, rulemaking like the filibuster, uh, Jim Crow legacies that um, allow for um, uh, policies to be stopped, installed that are sort of uh, in the interest of the majority and that the majority of the people actually want, but we can't sort of move forward. Then you have voter suppression, uh, laws designed um, all around the country, and these voter suppression laws are not new, right? We watched right after President Obama got elected, where you saw laws that said you could vote with your gun license, but not your student ID, as the sort of uh, discriminatory voter IDs popped up. These tailored um, policies that were intended to keep some people out and allow some people in. Um, and then um, we have all of the ways in which um, the right has really relied on its relationship to corporate power. The winks and the nods of resources going into these companies. Sometimes these corporations may come say, buy our products or use our services, but have winked and nodded at these companies. One of the most uh, visible campaigns that I've ever run at Color of Change was the multi-year campaign to force over a hundred corporations to divest from the American Legislative Exchange Council, also known as ALEC, a right-wing policy shop that actually designed those those original voter ID laws that were coming around the country, only for us to see all of these corporations that were behind that, even while they were sort of putting out, you know, Black History Month celebrations or, or ads talking about the heroes of our communities who had fought and died, um, not just for racial justice, but as part of efforts to protect the right to vote. So, I think it's important that we understand the strategy. It's also important that we understand that there were no good old days. There were no days in which uh, um, we had sort of um, unfettered access to the ballot. The, the machines or the, the um, voting equipment in our communities have never worked the way it worked in other communities. We've always had longer lines. We've always had barriers to access, but we overcame those things. We organized, we pushed ahead. And so, the attempt now is to continue to sort of uh, continue to press on us. Um, how much more can you take? How much more can you take until you break? And part of um, the strategy of me um, um, engaging with the other brothers, part of all the work that we try to do in terms of elevating and providing a pathway for people to be powerful um, at Color of Change is a deep recognition that we will always lose in the back rooms if we do not have the people lined up at the front door. And right now, in order to get the people lined up at the front door, we need more people engaged. We need more people aware. We need more people paying attention. And so if that means that we more of us have to put ourselves out there um, in order to keep this front and center, if more of us have to make ourselves part of the story in order to make sure that those in power don't think that they can sort of uh, sidestep this or think they're going to ask us to just work harder the next election, then that has to be part of the strategy because it's connected to a long game that the right has of making us disappear from government, making us disappear from political power, just as we are working to achieve more and more in our society. You know, I, I was looking down, just I, I pulled the article that uh, it was more of a kind of a memo to corporate America that Ken Chenault wrote in the New York 
times, David, um, about this corporate responsibility. But you're someone who um, interacts. Uh, you put your good your good blazer on like you got on the day and you interact with uh, those individuals in C-suites around the country, particularly black folk. Um, is it permeating? Is this issue loom as large as I framed it out to be uh, the civil rights issue of our time? Are you seeing that level of urgency similar to the question I asked Rashad? So I'll start by saying thank you to Black Enterprise for putting this together. And, and it is an honor to be on the virtual stage with the civil rights leaders and giants uh, who I've admired for so long and enjoy getting that opportunity to begin working with now. Um, and uh, while the issue is in the discussion, it is not nearly urgent enough. I think we had a moment back, uh, it was March 31st, that 72 black senior corporate executives and CEOs put a full page ad in the New York Times. And then March 14th, that hundreds of uh, corporate executives and other officials uh, put an ad in uh, and from inside and outside of the black community, essentially reinforcing uh, the, the call to democracy saying, we are businesses that stand for democracy. Um, and we're at an interesting uh, inflection point in our country's history where on one hand, uh, history is repeating itself. Once again, black folks, or, or I should say, uh, the, the people in power who are resistant to change and, and particularly the coloring of America uh, do not want to see that change and do not want to see uh, political power gained increasingly by black folks, and we've seen this before, um, are using even more sophisticated than ever tactics to uh, keep black folks away from the polls. And, and a lot of that is misinformation. Um, where uh, among many other tactics. Um, where that is changing or where history is changing is I think the role that um, we all have to play in getting good information into the hands of the people who have the responsibility to use it. And as we think about the role that corporations play in America, it, it is larger now than it's ever been in shaping our democracy and in essentially writing the rules of the road of how we interact with each other, who has political power, um, how we should treat each other. And what we're asking for the business community is to say, if, if you, particularly in the last year, since the pandemic, since we've been talking about systemic inequities and particularly since George Floyd's murder, and we've seen more lip service and more financial commitments paid to um, racial equity and commitments to be part of the solution, not the problem. If companies really have a commitment to racial equity and including black folks uh, and improving the black experience in America, they absolutely have to get off the sidelines and play a part in this conversation. And, and the choice not to speak up is a choice. Um, and if you're choosing to be on one side of history or not, not speaking is a deliberate choice that you're making. So we're essentially calling out to the business community and saying, you, you have a very clear choice to make. You can be on one side, of it, be part of the, the solution or part of the problem. And there are a number of things they can be doing, everything from helping their employees get good information um, and, and there are a lot of different things that we need to do to mobilize, educate, and empower uh, both employees and other stakeholders of corporations to make sure that we're holding their feet to the fire and, and keeping them accountable. So while we have, I think for the first time, a critical mass of black leadership who can literally pick up the phone and call other CEOs, call fellow members of boards of directors that they sit on boards with, et cetera, and say, where are you on this? You have to act. Um, this is absolutely about black people. This is absolutely about race. Um, and, and we had laws in place that protected us that are being taken away and we're, we're taking steps in the wrong direction. Uh, there needs to be, we've lost some of that momentum, unfortunately, since March and since April. So there's a lot of work for us to be done. We're at a critical inflection point where we have an opportunity between now and really the end of the year, beginning of next year, really before the 2022 election, uh, to make a difference that's going to have impacts for generations to come on how we vote. Um, and what the black experience and, and really the opportunity for black folks to play a role in perhaps the most fundamental way that you engage in a democracy, which is voting and actually having your vote uh, count. So David, I, I'm a, I want you guys to follow me here as I try to navigate this discussion because I'm gonna put a pin in corporate responsibility and accountability, but we're gonna come right back to that. I think we need to flesh out a little bit more so everyone understands the framing of the issue we we're dealing with because Melanie and Rashad, if you can just talk briefly to the fact that this is not a Republican Democrat issue, because a lot of times, and the reason that we're having the major impediment we're having right now is because of moderate Democrats who won't move the ball forward. So how should we frame this issue to get more people, particularly those who are 
watching who may be a part of corporate America, who are business owners, entrepreneurs, et cetera, to understand their role in this struggle, because we can rail against the right all we want. But, the, you know, there are a lot of folk out here who said justice was on the ballot, namely me. Right. <laughs> we all said justice was on the ballot, but it doesn't look like we're getting a return on investment on our justice issues, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, and in this case, H.R. 1 and the John Lewis Voting Rights Bill. So talk about how we should frame this going forward, understanding the political trajectory and dynamic that we're in. Um, Raha, you wanna go first? Okay. Uh, we have to hold our elected officials accountable, our friends and our foes, or those who we voted for and those who we did not. Uh, why are we getting uh, doing uh, nonviolent civil disobedience uh, on, and, and doing all the things that we're doing is because things aren't moving, you know. Uh, so that means whether it's a Democrat or Republican, for those who, who are listening, uh, find out where your senator is. Um, you, you may be in a state where you have a Republican or you may be in a state like West Virginia or just factual, not trying to be, you know. Uh, uh, partisan or anything, but just factually, you know, you have Senator Manchin uh, in uh, West Virginia and Cinema in Arizona um, who are, um, who don't believe that the rules, and, and, and Rashad talked about the, the process, the rule, the filibuster, right, which uh, is, is, a, is a hindrance. And, and what people need to understand is, a, and what we've been saying, and I know what I've been saying, and many others is, a process should not override the people, we the people, right? And so a process that is rooted in, in racism in the first place should, you know, I, I believe it should be ended. So people say amend it, do whatever you need to do to move these issues of justice that we voted for, that we, we, we took our lives in our hands with, in, a, um, in a global pandemic and went out there and voted and we need people to, to own up so we've been pushing the president, pushing the, pu pushing the vice president, pushing the senators. Uh, we know on the, uh, there's a John Lewis bill being redrafted that will come up at some point, but we have no choice. And what we, what, if people don't understand anything, understand that the option is to not have your voting rights versus having them. That's where we are because you have the 48 states that we all talk about where you know, that in many of those states, you actually have voter suppression laws that aren't just about how you vote. What really struck me uh, more than anything was the fact that in Georgia, as an example, right, where the law that was passed in Georgia also makes it so that the state that's run by one party, and it happens to be the Republican party, can decide who sits on a board of elections which helps us out who counts your vote. Or if I don't like what happened, I can go and figure out how to override what happened in the count. That's a whole nother level of, 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 of suppression and voter thievery uh, that will happen in 2022. Not 20, wait, no, 2024. It will, ha it will happen in 2024. You also have those same states will control who are looking to oppress and suppress are going to control how lines are drawn to decide on redistricting, which is getting in the weeds, but how you decide your ability as a voter to elect candidates of choice or run yourself to even have a shot at winning because it, it will be rigged and you will have one party, a one party rule. That is where we are, the democracy is, is, is teeter-tottering. January 6th is an example of what is happening out here with all, all of that going on and all these laws passed because the former president doesn't want to admit he lost, right? And so here we are as a country, we are really at a crossroads in this country. And it is a state of emergency that everybody has a role to play if you believe in this democracy and inclusion versus exclusion, uh, then you have to speak up. You got to speak up now. That fierce urgency of now is an important point we'll get to. That's that's my conclusion. But we got a wide ways to go before we get there. R Rashad, yeah. uh, she mentioned the filibuster, which is where I was going. And, you know, we talk about I actually gave their numbers out on live TV one day. Uh, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, but they're actually speaking for 
a lot of their Democratic colleagues who just don't like the attention. I mean, they're speaking for the Shaheens and the testers and and some others. Warner just came out and said he would do a modified version of the filibuster. But talk about I don't I'm not going to just jump on you here and say, uh, talk about the history of the filibuster. Don't give me a lesson in that, per se. But talk about the role that it plays structurally in moving forward and how we should frame this argument. Because, again, we're, we're talking to people that we gave a majority. We're talking to people we voted for and we support. That seems to be a little different than the usual antagonistic approach we take in politics. Yeah, I mean, I think for this this audience of, of Black enterprise, for people who are inside of businesses, who are trying to make the case for maybe how their company or how they engage, how they engage in their circles, right? There are two sides on a lot of issues. There should not be two sides on whether or not Black people can vote, right? We um, can have conversations that are about left and right, but we need to be clear about what's right and wrong. And we need to be very clear when something is about morals and about moral authority and when something is political. And this is a conversation about who we are as a country, who we are as a people, and whether or not we are a democracy where we can all be heard, counted, and visible, regardless of whether we are privileged or vulnerable in the majority or the minority or in favor or out of favor with whoever may be in power at any particular point. And so the thing about the filibuster, which I think is really important for folks to understand, is that it's this tool that has evolved over time. At one time, uh, folks who were trying to employ the filibuster, which was basically this sort of a tool that allows you to go on and, and, and talk forever on the floor um, to basically stop um, the voting on a legislation, to stop a piece of legislation from being able to be voted on, folks had to actually go down into the well of the Senate. And they had to actually stay there and hold court. But after um, Strom Thurmond um, filibustered the Civil Rights Act, um, and so years later, and, 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 it, and it got such bad rating, right? It got such bad reviews, such bad polling. Folks saw it and were disgusted. People might not, who might not even like really were in favor of um, racial progress, saw the fact that they wouldn't, the way that it was done did not seem right. They started to evolve the filibuster where senators don't even have to actually go down and talk. They can sort of, it's a, it's a, it's, you know, you, you, we're, we're paying these folks with our tax dollars and they don't even have to like show up to work to actually filibuster something. They can sort of just sort of indicate that they're going to filibuster. And so for context, the re context for the, the reason why we don't have something like an anti-lynching law is because it has been filibustered a number of times. And sometimes it has been filibustered by folks actually going down into the well and speaking against it, you know, talking about things that have nothing to do with the legislation as a way to stall it and prevent it from coming to a vote. And other times it's been by people just indicating, senators just indicating that they would filibuster and not have to actually put in any work. The legislation has has evolved over time. So anyone who tells you that this is tradition, what you should recognize and understand is that the only tradition has been how this tool has been used to stall progress, um, an opportunity and access for Black communities and other communities working to get a foothold and opportunity in this country. That's the only tradition. It has evolved over time as folks have wanted to do less work to allow us to be able to have more opportunity. And so we should recognize that and we should recognize recognize the story that is told that is oftentimes incredibly ahistorical about how this tool has been used and why it's in place. And then we should push back against it and not let those um, um, that do not want to be visible um, in their sort of fight against inequality um, um, sit in the shadows and stop our progress. Make them be visible, make them have to speak on the floor, make them have to actually speak to what they care about at the minimum and at maximum, let's actually remove Jim Crow relics from our, um, our institutions um, so that we can actually move forward in a way that actually is meaningful. And so this is what we are actually fighting against. And so the, the other thing that I think is important for all of us is that racial justice became a majoritarian issue back last summer. The, Black people are not the majority, but those upticks in voter registration, the multiracial groups of people that get went to the streets. If we remember sort of in that moment, it's, it feels like forever ago now because of sheltering in place and all these things we've been to as a country. 
But if we remember, many people thought the best we could do in terms of activism was clap outside of our windows or uplift investigative journalism and racial justice drove people to the streets and helped people raise their voices. And so now that we know what racial justice can actually do for an election, it is time for our elected leaders to show us what an election can do for racial justice and not tell us that they need to keep relics of Jim Crow in place, but to actually remove those relics so we can actually advance not just voting rights, but advance um, you know, reform around policing, advance all the things that people actually went to the polls for, because that is what democracy is about making majoritarian issues governing majorities. That is how we make democracy work for all of us. I do want a, a random footnote. If anybody is at the bar doing trivia, um, Strom Thurmond, uh, my former senator from the great state of South Carolina, we refer to it as God's country, gave the longest filibuster in the history of the United States Congress. And he read, he read the Washington DC phone book. That's what he did. So. Um, if anybody's ever asked, yes. And he was he was filibustering what? Was he filibustering Rashad, just for the people so they know? Civil Rights Act. <laughs> exactly, of all things. So here we are, but how do we get corporate America to understand that the litmus test for black folk, our spending power, is voting rights? How do we get them to understand that this is our issue? Two things. One, Black folks have over a trillion dollars in uh, collective buying power. We are an absolute force. And um, as goes the, the Black economy, uh, the, so goes the rest of the U.S. economy. They are inextricably linked. Uh, and uh, City, the, the financial institution, put out a report in the fall of 2020 showing that if uh, the U.S. economy has missed out on $16 trillion of economic growth, um, $800 billion a year for over 20 years as a result of racial inequality. Um, and that we could add $5 trillion to US GDP if we were to close that gap. Uh, if you think about the most fundamental way that people engage with a democracy, it is their ability to vote and have a say in representative government and who uh, is making decisions about what things are most important. If we as black folks, as we have never have had equal opportunity to cast a vote and put people in place who are going to represent our interests and look out for our interests, that is absolutely uh, inextricably tied to our ability to have a functioning democracy uh, and, and therefore a, um, a, a robust and functioning economy. Um, but also it's, I, I think, drawing out to, a lot of people ask me, and I'm sure everybody on this panel has gotten this question, why, why should corporations or why do corporations need to care about voting rights? How are those, how is this their responsibility? Um, and I, I say it is absolutely, uh, I go back to what I said before about um, corporations are, there's polling, recent polling to show corporations are more trusted entities in today's society in America than government leaders are. They have more power than just about any other organizations to influence the outcome of legislation, influence the outcome of everything about how we live our lives. Um, also, there was a, a um, I think it was 2010 uh, Supreme Court decision, Citizens United, that gave corporations all kind of power to use their money and their political voice. Uh, so it was very interesting earlier this year where on one hand you had folks from uh, at the state level, um, state governors, lieutenant governors, and even Mitch McConnell, the uh, Republican leader in the Senate saying, um, you know, corporations need to stay in their lane, stay on the sidelines. This is not about, not about you, not about politics until we started talking about money. And he said, well, okay, well, yes, you know, corporations should be playing in politics with money, but not with your voice. Uh, so you, you kind of can't have it both ways. And I used to run the, uh, a component of uh, government relations, the state and local government relations team, the largest bank in America, uh, JP Morgan Chase and Company. And the role that the corporate community, that corporate America and corporate PACs have in swaying decisions, both in Washington, but also in state houses around the country, um, is undeniable. And if they do not take responsibility for using that role for good, then they are um, de facto uh, and, and by default using that for bad. Um, and a lot of companies uh, engage in and invest in these party committees that put in place people who take away rights um, from black folks and have been doing it for a very long time. And they will say, well, we, you know, we're really investing in them because it's about um, what they're doing on our regulatory issues and things that are germane to our business. You can't have it both ways. You absolutely have to invest in people who will look out for the interests of your stakeholders, your communities, and instability is bad for business. If you have um, January 6th happening around the country, 
because people are acting on bad information. You know, you think about um, the state of Michigan, you have a, a Republican controlled legislature where, um, you know, they are moving through all kind of problematic laws that very well may pass. And then you have a Democratic governor who may may well veto those. And that could, you know, people wanted to kidnap uh, and cause harm to the governor when she asked him to wear masks last year. You can imagine what that kind of scenario, uh, how that might play out um, in Lansing uh, and, and how that, uh, what that might mean in terms of the ability for any business in Michigan to do business and to attract talent and to keep talent in the state. So for all those reasons, we are all in this together. Corporations have a huge role to play here and they absolutely have to be a part of the solution, no longer part of the problem. Rashad and David, let me ask you both this and Rashad, I'm bringing you in because I, I recall a lot of the efforts you've done with Color of Change with entities like Facebook, et cetera. But Rashad and David, and you guys chime in, play off of each other, uh, do what you feel is best. But how do we hold these corporations accountable? Like, you know, everybody at the George Floyd, they think they all gonna win Nobel Peace Prizes, but then we pull back the curtain and it's nothing but performative justice, right? So you, you saw this with all the comp corporations saying they weren't gonna contribute to people who voted for or supported the insurrection. And now that is back in effect. You saw in Georgia, companies said they were gonna come out and support and not support those who perpetrated these uh, racist voter laws. And now we find out that they back giving them money. So how do we hold these entities accountable? I think is my question. And I want you guys to answer it from two perspectives. One, from my perch outside looking in, and two, for those individuals who may be on this call working in those places, how can they be sure to hold their companies accountable without them getting fired? Because they want to protest, but they ain't trying to get fired either. They got bills. Rashad, I'll let you go first. I'm happy to okay. follow up. So, we, so we've done, we're doing a couple of things at Color of Change. One, we've launched a campaign called Beyond the Statement. Beyondthestatement.com is our platform that is actually focused on pushing the companies that have made statements about Black Lives Matter to actually address and engage in really clear practices. And we're focusing on a, a range of industries and we're engaged in um, pushing those industries around how they're working. I mean, it's also not accepting performative statements. I mean, a lot of the companies that even spoke out after Georgia and those voter suppression laws, as someone who has worked in um, uh, advocacy and social justice and civil rights for years, I know what corporations do when they actually care about something. I know what they do when they actually want to um, bend a policy or practice um, their way. They don't speak out after the bill has been passed. They don't make statements about how uh, bad it is. They actually get in and they do the things to pull the levers that they've actually designed and manufactured to work in their favor over years of both work in the courts and lobbying and advocacy. They didn't pull those levers. They didn't actually um, engage in that work. And so their, their, their statements are, are, are presence without power. And we should recognize that. Um, the second, the other thing that we have been doing is we have been um, waging a campaign that's been focused um, on running geo-targeted ads uh, to the employees of these companies in um, communities around, in, in both the, the states like Michigan, Texas, Georgia, and Arizona, but also, you know, in other places as well. And those um, geo-targeted ads that actually, if you work at those companies, you may have seen ads on Facebook or Google that are really focused on giving you the tools and the frameworks to speak up and push back. We um, uh, know jimcrowfilibuster.com is another place where we're actually doing a lot of education work specifically around the filibuster, but in giving people real ways to raise their voices. You know, one of the things I think about a lot, not just for the seven you know, plus million members of color of change, but I think about in the larger sort of community space is how do we give more people the ability to be heard on these issues, to be loud and present, to be strategic and focus all of the ways in which we're raising our voices. And one thing that we have found over the last couple of years, and I think this is really important for people who work inside of companies, is that employees are incredibly powerful. The reason why so many of those companies made statements around Black Lives Matter, the reason why 
I woke up in the morning as a leading an organization that actually doesn't take corporate financial support, but woke up in the morning during those weeks after George Floyd's murder to statements of companies saying they were giving us money um, when we had never asked for it and wouldn't take it was because of people like you and your companies who spoke up and pushed your companies to do more, held them accountable around it. So whether you're part of an employee resource group, whether you're sort of engaged in your company in different ways, you have power to speak up, to give get people together. The changes we are seeing in holding some of the big tech companies accountable for misinformation and disinformation is coming directly from employees. So I would just say, you all have specific power and we need you in this moment to use it in whatever way makes sense. The more people that join together, the more protected you'll actually be in those efforts. Man, look, you may not take that money, but I know BEA, Melanie's organization, <laughs> Uh, uh, we, 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 we redirected it. We told them to give it other oh, places. I'm just letting but, you know yeah, that you've got yeah. three other people on here hey. who will gladly, gladly take you all need us to keep pushing them so that the oh. checks actually get to the size that they could possibly be if these companies were really about it. They, Melanie, was, they, they all need to add extra zeros. They all need to add extra zeros. Chime Reverend in, Joseph yeah. Laurie told me a long time ago, Rashad, one thing about, um, I don't, I don't take it the wrong way, tainted money is tainted enough. So never will you give me any enough money for me not to speak truth to power for right. our people. Right. It's your responsibility to, to support those uh, uh, who, who you make profit from. Mm -hmm. So that's all I got to say. Hey, Amen. David, you got any <laughs> answers to that accountability question? Yeah, let me first associate myself with the comments of the you know the gentleman from Color of Change from New York. Um, I agree with all of that, uh, and and you're absolutely right, Melanie. That um, we are very clear at the Black Economic Alliance. Anytime we engage in a relationship with someone, we say, "Be prepared to hear some hard truths internally and externally," and that's in the public sector, private sector, um, and and there is no price on on our integrity and and us telling the the, the truth to power, speaking truth to power. But um, I would only add to, to Rashad's point, we have agency. And, and there, was a, there was about a three to four week period uh, earlier in the spring where CEOs in particular, not just corporations, but, but C-suites and CEOs felt the impetus and uh, the actual need to act and to figure out where they were going to be. We have to recreate, we have to reignite that groundswell of activity, a public conversation, absolutely mobilize uh, among each other, something that BEA is working on alongside our partners at the Executive Leadership Council, our campaigns to educate black employee resource groups as Rashad talked about and, and business resource groups about why this is germane to their company in particular and what tools they have to, and this is really more of a BEA effort to mobilize um, why and how they need to mobilize in a uniform fashion to advocate inside of their companies for their leadership to take action if they really care about racial equity and to talk to each other in that process. We, we need to do this collectively among and form coalitions among employees, among other um, stakeholders. And we've seen others do this very successfully on other issues, everything from pipelines, environmental issues and private prisons and you know, getting companies to change their, their, their business activity in certain places. Um, we have the same agency, we have to use it and use it collectively. Um, so you'll be hearing more from BEA and ELC on that front, but um, I encourage everyone to, to kind of take up arms and, and avail yourselves of good information. That's the other piece of this. One of the, the consistent things we've heard from the business community is, well, we're confused. We don't know, you know, HR1 versus HR4, For the People Act or John Lewis Act, what do you want? What's the ask? There are too many things coming at us from different organizations. We need to clarify for everybody. This is not as complicated as it's made out to be. And there's very good information out there. I would point folks particularly to the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, the Brennan Center for Justice. Folks have done a very good job of rolling up a lot of this information and making it clear. Uh, so that's part of our job as well is to get that good information into the hands of people who can use it and direct them uh, toward action. That's important to note because there are a lot of people out here selling you they just wanna pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Bill, but that won't fix anything that's happening in Georgia or Texas or anything that's passed. So we need to make sure we're very knowledgeable about what's going on. And people are going to be like, wait a minute, what do you mean? What do you mean? And look, I don't have time to go into it right now. Just do what David said, which is to go to Brennan Center or some of these other organizations and download, educate yourself on these issues. Uh, Melanie, I got an important question because there are a lot of people watching who want to get involved beyond their corporate culture. So are black, I know the answer to this, but I just want to pose it to you. Are black folk working together? Like we got color of change on here. We got the Urban League BEA on here. 
I mean, are we all working together? How can we get involved? <laughs> and if I'm if if I'm a part of a sorority or Jack and Jill or the Lynx or fraternity, um, how can we get involved with these organizations doing God's work? Well, well, I would say uh, we have a Black Women and Allies group called Black Women Take Action. So you can go to blackwomentakeaction.org. Uh, you have uh, uh, the brothers are doing, I know that with uh, Black uh, Voters Matter, um, uh, you mentioned all of our uh, voting rights organizations, our civil rights organizations. What I've, what I've been trying to do is like, be like, hey, we're getting on the phone more. You know, a lot of us are and trying ways to collaborate. You know, Reverend uh, uh, Barber is doing his Moral Mondays. There's a, lot, there's, there's a lot that folks can do. But if you, if you want to get involved with the Black women, go to black uh, blackwomentakeaction.org and you can get involved. We'll keep you involved. And we're in connecting people because at the end of the day, we have to keep pushing uh, throughout the summer. We say there's a summer of activism. It has to be. We, and we have to have this vote, our uh, federal voting rights reform pass this year so that we will have the opportunity to have uh, our voices heard and that we can continue to build uh, political power so we can have an even better quality of life in this country that we built. Listen, as we kind of wrap this thing up, um, I want you guys to give a call to action because one of the things we have identified the problem, we know it's not... Um, Democrat or Republican, we know it's a it's a problem across the board. So we've identified it. We know the filibuster is there. We know what things have to get passed in order for us to have a better plight and lessen the load in our world. So the call to action, talk to folk who are watching this, particularly geared towards the entrepreneurs, the business leaders, um, the people who we know subscribe and ascribe to the values of black enterprise. In a few words, Let's get them to go out because I'm, I'm always cognizant. Melanie will appreciate this. I'm always cognizant of Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. I, I, I believe in order. His best piece of writing was Letter from the Birmingham Jail. Number two was the book entitled uh, Where Do We Go From Here? And then number three, I believe, was the I Have a Dream speech. But it wasn't that rhythmic cadence of I Have a Dream that one day we shall. Instead, it was when he talked about the fierce urgency of now. We can get to 2022, but by that time, it's going to be too late. So how can we, what's the call to action for everyone right now to have that fierce urgency as they go out in the world? Melanie, I'll start with you. Thanks so much again for, for, this, for this conversation. And again, I just, it's just been great to, to see everybody. I'm glad we can be out of these boxes uh, even more. Um, I want to also lift up, and I forgot, because my partner in this is Dr. Janetta Cole from National Council of Negro Women and 20 other organizations, and I get in trouble if I name them all, uh, who are, and plus organizations who are working with, with us. Uh, so to, 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 to what you can do is pick up that phone and call 202-224-3121, 202-224-3121, uh, and call your congressperson, call your U.S. Senator, tell them to pass the For the People Act. Right, and, and when the John Lewis bill comes up, uh, that's coming up in the fall, pass that too. But that's what you can do. You can make those phone calls. And if your senator is already on board, thank them and, and tell them to try to get some of their colleagues on board. But that's what you can do. Whether you have a Democratic, uh, if it's a Democrat, Republican, or Independent, uh, um, make those phone calls. That's something you can do right now. You know, I, I, wanna, I wanna just agree with all that and just add, um, you know, when I was right after being arrested, um, I ended up, you know, in a in a jail cell with uh, Congressman Hank Johnson from Georgia, uh, Cliff Albright from Black Voters Matter, Mondale Robinson from uh, the Black Male Voter Project, and Reverend uh, Mark Thompson. And the five of us were all sort of in the same cell. And I mean, you know, it was one of those moments where if they knew that we never got a really a chance to spend that much time thinking and strategizing together um, uninterrupted, they probably would have never put us there together. But it did give us this moment to sort of be in conversation about what does it mean, you know, what does it mean for the path forward? What does it mean to get more of us involved? What does it mean to not just get over this hurdle in terms of the Voting Rights Act, but reimagine 
how we do this work different? What is our relationship to power? How do we make sure that we're not just working to get uh, folks from other communities elected through our engagement, but working to get more of our people in power? And so the call to action that I wanna provide is building off of what Melanie has said around this sort of immediate moment of what we have to do, but also the sort of long-term effort of what does it mean to translate the presence and visibility of this moment into the power to actually change the rules, the written rules and the unwritten rules. And so I wanna invite you all to join something in your local community, your local organization. Of course, join us at colorofchange.org and we will direct you to local actions and actions you can engage with at the national level, particularly ways that we can engage around accountability around the filibuster and working to sort of remove the barriers to pass these laws. But part of this work is gonna be about us, not just winning this fight, but reimagining the ways in which we build, use, and advance our power in this country so that we are not just fighting against stuff, but we're able to un unlock all the potential moving forward. David. So I, you know, I, I'd like folks to think about a, a question that has come up more in the last year and a half than I think it has throughout, you know, my entire life, which is comparing this time to the civil rights movement, particularly the 1960s, and folks saying, what would I have done if I were there then? And you're absolutely right, Bakari, about the urgency of now. This is our moment. And the consequences are absolutely clear. Our ability to have our voices heard in a representative government it is not only on the ballot, but it is actually at risk because of our turnout last year, because we beat and defied the odds of a global pandemic and, and coordinated efforts to keep Black people from the polls. Because we were successful, these efforts are now being taken to strip those rights immediately and, and systematically on an ongoing basis. So I, I absolutely agree with everything Melanie and, and Rashad have said. Um, and I just uh, ask people to, to uh, kind of don't assume that somebody else is handling. Yeah. Think about what is your opportunity to plug in? What are the organizations in your community? If you work at a corporation, go to your Black Business Resource Group leadership and ask them, what are we doing? How can we organize? When can we sit down with our CEO and talk about what we're doing as a company to educate our, uh, our constituents, our uh, employees and our stakeholders, um, but also to make it easier for them to vote and to have a voice on this, but also go to your, uh, there are all organizations locally, any one of those organizations that you either have access to already or don't, ask them what are they doing and, and how are they coordinating with others? I think the question about what coalition building are we doing? We need to hold each other accountable on that. And I think this conversation is a great step along that, that path. So for everybody, take ownership, take agency. Um, do not assume that somebody else is acting. If you're not acting, you're not doing enough to set us on the right path. Guys, I just wanna say thank you again to Black Enterprise for bringing us all together. Uh, this has been a part of the Black Enterprise Town Hall series. This is probably one of the most important issues that we'll deal with and I'm glad we're giving it this time. It reminds me of in 1964 when a young man who looked a lot like me, his name was Cleveland Sellers, uh, they were up at Miami University of Ohio training civil rights workers to go down to Freedom Summer in Mississippi. Um, three of their fellow slain civil rights workers didn't come back. Um, and my father actually led the search mission in Philadelphia, looking in ditches and trenches to find uh, those three young men, Goodman, Scherner, and Cheney. The, these times are still here. They're still with us. They're still present. We are still fighting that fight. So join us. Thank you to Black Enterprise. Thank you to all of you all for your time today. Stay tuned for our future town halls that will be coming. I will be moderating them all. We're going to have a great group of panelists just like we had today. And thank you all. God bless you all. Uh, and see you again. Good night. I'm Alfred Edmund Jr., SVP and Executive Editor at Large of Black Enterprise. Thank you all for joining us for the Black Enterprise Economic Equity and Racial Justice Town Hall on Voter Suppression. We hope you're leaving today's virtual experience better informed, energized, and yes, determined to do whatever you can to preserve, protect, and expand Black voting rights. Remember, you can return to watch this important conversation on demand and invite others to do so as well. We encourage you to share your thoughts and insights from the discussion on social media using the hashtag BETownHall. Thank you to our excellent moderator, Bakari Sellers, and all of our speakers for sharing their insights on a topic critical to the advancement of Black people. Also, we extend an extra special thanks to our series sponsor, the Executive Leadership Council, 
for partnering with us on a shared mission of Black economic empowerment. Join us for our next Economic Equity and Racial Justice Town Halls on Home Ownership and Wealth Building, September 9th, on Education, October 14th, and on Black Women, December 3rd. And you definitely want to mark your calendars now for the Black Enterprise Entrepreneurs Conference on September 15th and 16th, Women of Power Tech on October 27th and 28th, and Black Men Excel on November 17th and 18th. For more information on these events, go to blackenterprise.com slash BE events. The message today was loud and clear. It is up to us, all of us, to protect our right to vote. We are counting on you to stay engaged and do your part.